Coming up on Digital Music Trends 231 on the 6th of May 2015, two significant shutdowns as both GrooveShark and Simfy closed their doors this week, albeit for very different reasons, endless Apple Music streaming rumors, Instagram launches at music, the future of Twitter, Live Nation acquires a majority interest in Bonnaroo and the future of music festivals. This week's show is brought to you by Gramophone, a small device that can turn your traditional sound system into a Wi-Fi music player. The Gramophone relies on your home Wi-Fi rather than on Bluetooth, which allows for higher sound quality. And Gramophone has just announced the integration of Qualcomm's AllPlay technology, which means that the device now also supports Napster, Rhapsody, TuneIn Radio and Opio in addition to Spotify, with support for more services planned by the end of the year. We thank them for their support of Digital Music Trends check out the website on gramophone.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And if you have been following the show over the past few weeks, uh, you will know that this is the last of the regular weekly shows for Digital Music Trends, sadly. So just a few words before I introduce uh, this week's guests, uh, Emily White and Glenn Peoples, uh, and we blast through the week's news uh, one more time. Uh, so first of all, there may be still some podcasts uh, being released in the future, just not quite as regularly, and I will most certainly put together a best of the MT this summer when I have a bit more time uh, to sort of collate some of the best moments uh, of the show so make sure you sign up to the newsletter on bit.ly slash DMT list uh, the emails will be few and far between and so don't worry about them clogging up your inbox I'll be very considerate as to how many emails I send out also I'm currently working on a project that if it was to work out it could take up uh, the best part of the next year which is to shoot a documentary that encapsulates uh, what I've covered over the past six years uh, and sort of picks up from the post Napster times and looks at the evolution of uh, music uh, subscription services uh, in particular between uh, sort of 2003 and today uh, starting with a sort of DRM to mp3s uh, and taking and taking it from there and I'll have more news on that uh, by the end of June beginning of July so stay tuned for that and in the meantime thank you so much for listening to the show over the past few years it has been a real pleasure hosting it and this week obviously we had to have a few uh, glitches on the show and so uh, the video is a little bit scatty I think the system dropped a few frames uh, but the audio is absolutely fine so apology if you are watching the video version it's a little bit scatty but if you're on the audio version enjoy the show uh, this week it's a real pleasure to welcome to the show uh, emily white founder of uh, white smith entertainment so hi emily and thanks for joining me how's it going uh it's going great my pleasure to be here it's great to have you and uh, also uh, it's great to welcome to the show glenn peoples a senior editorial analyst at billboard so hi glenn and thanks for joining me once again for the last show how's it going it's going good. Thank you for having me. Uh, as you as you wrap up the show, it's really nice to be here again. Yeah, exactly. And it's uh, it, it's uh, been a really fun few years, uh, and uh, uh, there will still be the odd uh, show coming out, but it won't be uh, quite on the same uh, regular basis as it's been over the last uh, three years, anyway. And uh, this week we have a bunch of stuff to talk about, which is great. Actually, it's it's a really good show to end on uh, because we are kind of wrapping up on some of the the uh, core themes that we covered in, on DMT over the last few years, and so. Uh, for First of all, uh, we are going to start uh, uh, by talking about Groove Shark. So this is one of the companies that I remember walking around Medium uh, back in 09, I think it well, probably was, and had this tiny little table at, at uh, like the very early iteration of, of Medium's uh, uh, sort of startup y sort of techy side. It was sort of in a corner of the conference center. And I remember having a chat with them back then. And, you know, there's been such a journey since then for them, for in, in, in mostly in a bad way, <laughs> but also, I'm sure they also had fun in the meantime. Uh, but they had that nice sand castle at Meetem that was giant and beautiful. So maybe yes. that was like a good moment yes. for them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Was that was that twenty ten or twenty? I think that was twenty ten. Twenty ten. It was the year after, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 That the sand castle got a lot of attention. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so uh, you know the, the company is now shut down as many of my listeners will have uh, possibly heard uh, the, the message stated we started out uh, nearly 10 years ago with the goal of helping fans share this and discover music but despite the best of intentions we made serious mistakes we failed to secure licenses from rights holders uh, from, uh, from from the vast amount of music on the service that was wrong we apologize without reservation so this is a, a, a very uh, out of character statement for for, for Goof Shark, uh, who have been fighting tooth and nail for the last few years, uh, but the issue is that they were facing a potential seven hundred million dollar uh, judgment against them, uh, since the judge uh, stated that uh, essentially they could be fined for up to one hundred and fifty grand per track that was infringed, uh, and so essentially, you know, uh, I guess that 
kind of scared them into uh, closing down the company. Uh, although uh, already a few days after this has happened, uh, there is a, a mirror side of the Groove, uh, Groove Shark uh, on GrooveShark.io that has already uh, been launched, uh, and the 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 anonymous uh, founder of this of this clone is making bold claims about his future. But uh, once again, you know, it feels like the the the, the core of the company is gone. Uh, Glenn, uh, how did you take this uh, demise? Uh, did you feel like after the judge uh, made that statement and those kind of damages were in in, 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 in on, on the cards, uh, uh, that was the only option the company had? I think so. Yeah, as you said, they were facing very large uh, statutory damages. Um, the penalties actually imposed were seventy-five million total across two settlements, uh, which is still a lot of money, and that's yeah. I'm sure money that uh, Escape Media does not have. So, uh, so it's I think a little more of a symbolic victory than anything when it comes to actual uh, monetary damages. Yeah, uh, I think um, I think the clock was was going to run out sooner or later. And I, I, like myself, I think people are just surprised that they lasted as long as they did. Yeah. Um, you know, when you, have, uh, when you have a business model uh, that uses uh, user-uploaded content and the DMCA takedown notices, uh, you can survive a lot longer than business models that don't have those facets. So um, I think... To, to some degree, the company was its uh, own worst enemy, and it did not even get to the point of, of having uh, of being able to use the safe harbor defense, yeah. which um, you know was its its own fault. Really, uh, it didn't have the the proper safeguards in place. Uh, it didn't. Uh, it was not um, was not notifying repeat users and, and kicking them off the service and doing the basic things that the DMCA asks of digital services. Uh, so I don't think this, the, the safe harbor defense would have worked in the long run anyways, but they, they didn't even get to that point. And yeah. uh, so it was, it was going to come to a close at some point. Uh, it just happened to be now. Exactly, and it feels like you know that email that uh, the, the CEO sent, uh, essentially telling everybody to upload as much music as possible, was sort of the death uh, death knell of the company because there was no getting around that, and that was sort of that happened, and uh, you know the damages were going to be awarded uh, uh, accordingly. Uh, Emily, as as a sort of somebody that represents rights holders, uh, uh, do you say yay, this is great? Uh, do you think this is still a missed opportunity because this, they still had a lot of users? Uh, how do you feel about about how this came down? I mean. Um Amazingly, I really like the concept of it. The problem is the technology was just too far ahead of legal. Right. Um, so I like the idea of user-generated content, um, but you're not going to win with such a traditional industry such as music who are going to fight that tooth and nail. So um, like Glenn said, I'm surprised this didn't happen sooner. At the same time, I am, you know, a lot of people are moving away from having files on their computer um, and, and are looking to streaming. So, um, like I said, I, I'm all for actually user generated content. You just have to be really, really smart about it and get ahead of it, you yeah. know, as opposed to just, oh, here's the platform and technology. Let's make sense of it, sense of that later. That's unfortunately, that's not really going to work with um, traditional rights holders. Yeah, and I mean, we're seeing already the problems that SoundCloud is facing in, in licensing uh, uh, commercial music. And, and you know, if, if they're having problems, and they, they always sort of were very upfront about the fact that rights holders were supposed to be uploading their own content, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if they're having problems uh, licensing content, then you would imagine that Greer Shark would have <laughs> yeah. A much bigger fish to fry, especially after sort of skirting the law on on uh, uh, in so many years. And you know, amazing that they lasted that long. Uh, Glenn, you you actually wrote a, a piece about that, and, and it, it does feel like, it, to a certain extent, it was also due to the slowness of the of the system in, in the U.S. Right? Because if some of these lawsuits had come, you know, to a close and they had to actually pay up earlier, perhaps the company would have had to close sooner. Right? Um, yeah, I suppose so. I. I sup I think this probably could have been accelerated quite a bit. Um, you know, the music business of the last few years is not like the music business uh, 10 years ago. Uh, rights owners tend to be a little slower uh, to, um, to put lawsuits on digital services. Yeah. Uh, Do you think they were ever fast, though? Uh, yeah, I think back in the days of like Mux Tape and Project Playlist. Right. Uh, yeah, the threats did come pretty quickly. Yeah, uh, and everybody's had a little slow, been a little slower, and had a more open mind. I think. Yeah. Uh, 
that said, Groove Shark never never acted like a partner in the way that uh, Spotify did, or even that SoundCloud is trying to be. Yeah. And if you're not going to be a partner to record labels, they're going to go after you in court, and they have a very long memory, and they're not going to license, and they're not going to play ball with a bad actor. Yeah. And Groove Shark had the, uh, had the reputation of being a bad actor, and I think that once you get that, that reputation... Uh, uh, with the major labels, it's going to be pretty much impossible to shake that. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And uh, and uh, you know, from one closure to another, uh, the, another service that shut down this week, and it feels like really the end of an era for 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 both, uh, is the Synfy, which was uh, uh, at one stage the, the first and and the, and the only uh, streaming music service in Germany, uh, uh, launched in 2008, I believe there, or 2009. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I haven't got my notes down here. Uh, but essentially, you know, uh, it's been on for a long, long time. Uh, it was the only streaming offering in Germany. Uh, I I knew a couple of the founders, uh, but all, they all exited. In uh, 2012, so it's been sort of a standalone company uh, without founders being involved for a long time, and they essentially didn't manage to counter the uh, uh, competition that was being uh, brought uh, by companies like Deezer and Spotify and uh, uh, Warner Music who withdrew their, li- their their music in February, and so that kind of uh, spelled the beginning of the end uh, for uh, the service. Uh, the users are being directed to Deezer, so they managed to make uh, some sort of deal with them uh, to uh, uh, give uh, um, the users of Sim some sort of place to fall back on uh, although there is of course a lot of uh, sort of uh, uh, animosity online uh, about the closure because apparently they had dissolved the company already on 26th of March uh, but the communication didn't come to the users until the 1st of May which is quite a lot uh, later uh, than the actual official sort of dissolution uh, in, in the equivalent in the uh, equivalent of the UK's company's house I'm not sure what, what it's called in the US but essentially the, the register of, of, of official companies uh, of Emily, th- th- were you familiar with uh, with uh, Simfy at all? Do, do you think that uh, this kind of spells the beginning of of, of uh, a few services that sort of never quite made it and might not be able to make it much longer if they if they don't expand? I was aware, and I think they were very much ahead of their time. And yeah. I'm very all for competition in streaming. I think it's really exciting when there's more than one platform and options, and it's going to be really fascinating to see how it all shakes out and kind of what the users and, and consumers prefer. Um, but at the same time, it's very frustrating when labels are pulling their catalogs and favoriting certain stri- streaming services and things like that, because that's not good for competition. I really want to see um, streaming services come about that make sense and are fair and are transparent. So to me, the more the better. So it's always a bummer when someone's shutting down. But, yeah. you know, being pre-Spotify, uh, that that's a tough position to be in. So. Um, kudos to them for being so ahead of their time, but at the same time, I'd like to see rights holders embracing streaming platforms and competition and new platforms so we can figure out what does make the most sense, both both for artists and fans. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Glenn, do you think that there are? I mean, this is kind of a strange... Uh, uh uh, service just because there aren't that many services that are remained of, of that size or do you think that there is anything any other service you can think of that is sort of that size and and might need to figure out what to do i was thinking wimp obviously was the other one but they've also gone now uh i'm trying to think of another service that is sort of a smallish size so i think rdo is is one that comes to mind that they will um they will probably be part of a consolidation that happens uh well i think it's already happening um, you know, we've seen um, Deezer by Cricket. Yeah. Um, I think we'll see um, some mergers, or probably we'll call them acquisitions, and they'll look like mergers. And, and yeah. a company will try to get uh, another services uh, users to migrate over to theirs. Um, you know, this happened when Rhapsody bought Napster years ago, and yeah. uh, and they tried to get. Napster's users to migrate over to the Rhapsody service. Um, I just think it's inevitable. I don't think that there are enough uh, services uh, making enough money, uh, showing enough promise. I think the I, I think the investors, the founders, will probably have to make some some difficult decisions uh, for some services in the next few years. Uh, and I think I honestly I think there are just too many similar services out there. Um, going after a market that's really honestly not growing very much right now. That might change with Apple, and Apple might kickstart um, a lot of growth in the subscription service business. Uh, 
and it would be very helpful if Apple did. Um, Apple would go. Apple would be kind of the mainstream product, right? Yeah. I think it's going to be pretty clear that they are not going to be try to be a niche service. Niche subscription services have a very difficult uh, economic model. There's just not a lot of money in this business to begin with, and you need a lot of users. Um, and unless there's a big addressable market, you can't have a niche service uh, yeah. because the niche is really small. Right now, that to be a niche service, you 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 might have I don't know 100,000, 200,000 subscribers. Uh, that's the niche in today's market. As the market grows, a niche might be able to be ten times bigger, might be able to eke out a living. Um, but but right now, I just think that um, I, I think there's not enough money to go around. Yeah. And and it's because uh, you can't be a niche service. You have to be very similar to everybody else. Uh, you have to be kind of a mainstream service. So everybody's going after the same type of, of user, with the exception of Tidal, which I think um, is, is going to corner the hip hop and R and B crowd. Right. And I think if you look at their uh, list of, of most popular songs and albums, you can see what they're listening to, and that's pretty clear. Um, so that might be the exception right now. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you know, you mentioned RD as well. It, that, that's a, that, that's a kind of weird exception because it's a service that hasn't managed to get the traction that it needs to really uh, become uh, perhaps a service where a VC would invest a lot of money in right now because of the performance. But at the same time, uh, it's backed by uh, billionaires, and so essentially the. Uh, how long is a piece of training? Like it, it just depends on how long they decide to keep funding the project, right? So, uh, <laughs> it's what I yeah. use as a fan. I really love their interface. Exactly, and lots of people love love it as well. So it's not like there's mm. a, a real issue with the product. It's just that they haven't quite managed to push it in the right way to to get it out there. So, uh, you know, again, it's not like they had a lack of funding. It's just a case of how do you get a product that hasn't captured people's imagination, uh, like Spotify has. Uh, and it doesn't have the traction that Google or Apple can put behind it. Uh, 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 you know, how do you get it in the hands of lots of people? That's that's kind it's of a a very, it's quietly a very good product. And mm -hmm. you know, I think uh, I get the feeling that if they had five years to work with, uh, they could put together a pretty good user base uh, because it is a good product, and they do have mobile partnerships, yeah. and, and there will be natural growth of this market. And over time, you know, they could they could get some subscribers, but it's just they don't they might not have that much time. Is the point? Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, at least you know they don't uh, have a freemium component, so their their overheads are probably lower than for other services. Uh, but it's still an expensive service to run, so I'm sure that they are uh, probably still losing quite a bit of money at the moment. Uh, and uh, talking about Apple, you know, that's uh, sort of a, a one of the big stories of the week, and Glenn, you wrote a couple of pieces on this uh, uh, as well. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of movement around this uh, music streaming service uh, side of things uh, for Apple uh, this week. Uh, you know, it's a, a kind of a, a, an Apple overload. Uh, and first of all, let's sort of t t take it into uh, chewable chunks. Uh, first of all, uh, last week, week, uh, well, The Verge shed some light on the investigations that uh, we reported on a few weeks back uh, by the European Com uh, Union's Competition Commission and Department of Justice. Uh, the Verge specifically states that uh, the uh, Apple is under investigation by the DOJ and the FTC now seems to have taken over that investigation uh, because it allegedly pressured labels to deny services like Spotify uh, the renewal of their free freemium licenses. So it's not their license over overall, just a freemium component of the licenses. Uh, uh, Apple does not plan on offering a premium tier and obviously would be beneficial to Apple if uh, Spotify and Deezer uh, didn't have their free tier because that obviously, obviously that uh, attracts a lot of users. Uh, uh, Glenn, uh, following the, this report, you wrote a piece on Billboard uh, stating that according to the several industry sources, Apple still doesn't uh, have all of the deals that it needs to go ahead with the launch. Uh, so th do you think that Apple will pull it off in the end? There's a lot of debate around whether this uh, June or September or even this year. Uh, do you think this is something they want to make happen? Well, they no doubt want it to happen, and I, the only question is when. Um, I, I think there's still a, a moderate to good chance that Apple could launch this next month. Um, they've been known to get licenses in short order in the past, so the fact that they don't have licenses right now is not the end of the world. Yeah. They can do yeah. this very quickly. Uh, I think the bigger issue is uh, 
would be the the service not being ready to ship, so to speak. Yeah. And if and if it's not done, then they'll they'll wait. I think as long as they need to. I don't think the market's going anywhere. Um, yeah. I think the only the only thing is that Spotify will increase uh, its already considerable lead the longer Apple waits. But I think Apple could, you know, if they're going to overcome that, they'll overcome it. I don't think it, I don't think a few more months is going to make a difference. Uh, I did also write about. Um, that Verge article, yeah. which I, I think we should take with a grain of salt. Um, I, I haven't, from people I've talked to, there's no evidence that uh, their companies have been contacted by the DOJ. We've already known that the FTC is looking into this, as well as the EC. Yeah. Um, and exactly what Apple is, you know, claimed to have been doing, uh, anti-competitive practices or just, you know, pushing its own particular business model and vision for the future of digital music, I, I think that's that's all up in the air right now. Yeah. I think it's much more likely that given the scrutiny that Apple is consistently under by regulators, that they're probably not doing anything so so blatantly illegal. <laughs> exactly. That's <right. laughs> what was claimed in the Verge article. I think it really strains credulity. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it kind of feels like, uh, okay, they, they love music and they want music, but, but Emily, I, I don't... You know, for a company like Apple Music, is is mm. kind of the cherry on the cake. And as much as they want the cherry, they they're not probably willing to attract a massive investigation just to, <laughs> you know, to get uh, to get the licenses done and to sort of uh, uh, take over uh, Spotify and other services. You know, how do you feel about about the service and how how the, the latest rumors are shaping up? Do do you think that it, it could uh, sort of uh, inspire people and, and inspire them to subscribe to subscription services if it's done right? Well, we need to remember that Apple and iTunes have a massive amount of data on all of us, on everything we've ever purchased. So that's going to be a huge part of the turnkey when they stream. They're going to know exactly how to market to us. I don't even remember what I've ever bought on iTunes. You know, like right. they have that information, which is why I really push fans and our artists to use Bandcamp because we know those fans, we get those email addresses. And the frustrating thing about working with iTunes over the past decade is all that information goes right to Apple. Um, you know, hearing that Apple's pressuring labels to get Spotify to eliminate free tiers is, I don't know what a European slang term would be, but is sketch. <laughs> it's really sketchy if it's true. Um, it, yeah. you know, I shouldn't be surprised. It kind of breaks my heart that those like old school bullying tactics might even be implied. Um, but at the same time, I found that incredibly interesting because, you know, there's all this lip service given to, oh, free is so terrible, but we need to remember that these free tiers are ad supported. So there are advertisers paying a lot of money so that can exist, which is actually how terrestrial radio has worked for years. Now, granted, that's not, of course, on demand, but I think people just say, oh, free, like it's such a waste. And what is it, 80% of Spotify's users are at the free tier. So yeah. for us, we need to be hooking in these users more and more because the more revenue there is, the more that will uh, get to rights holders, which many of my artists own their own rights. So they do see solid revenue from streaming. So um, I was disappointed to hear there might be some bullying tactics. And I really would be surprised if Apple um, does not have a free tier because it's ad supported. It, it's not free. There's revenue there, and they're going to want to get as many users as possible out of the gate. Yeah, it kind of feels I like think iTunes Radio is probably going to be their ad supported service. Mm -hmm. um, and they, you know, if they're smart, they'll they'll do a good job linking those two and trying to right. upsell, basically. And I think, um, you know, also given who they're hiring from the BBC, I don't know if they're going to the subscription service or to iTunes Radio or to both. But um, it seems like they have a lot of potential to do really cool things uh, yeah. with with radio kind radio type programming, which I think is sorely lacking from subscription services. Yeah, mm -hmm. the playlist will only go so far, and if you want a mainstream product, you're going to have to have radio in there somehow. Right. Absolutely, and I feel like uh, the only service that has paid any attention to it so far is Deezer, although I haven't seen the uh, integration between Stitcher and Deezer yet. Uh, I know they are the same company now, but uh, I would love to see how, how that actually operates on a day-to-day, because -day, uh, I think a lot of people would love to listen to podcasts alongside and, and radio shows mm -hmm. alongside uh, on-demand music, but that's essentially not possible right now, because uh, there, are, there are two siloed, uh, uh, different siloed environments uh, uh, on, on most services. Uh, and, and that's cool, that's kind of what I was saying about like on-demand at the beginning, 
beginning of this. You know, like what I loved about Napster when I was in high school is I could get, um, I'm, a, I'm obsessed with Oasis. <laughs> I could get all these Oasis B-sides that weren't even available in America. So I really liked that. And I remember in my head thinking I would pay 10, 20, I would pay, not that I had $50 a month as a teenager, but I would pay $50 a month for this service. So it's to your point of podcasts and talk radio and things like that. And, you know, we manage comedians. Um, there's all this other content out there and it's not all in one place. So um, I find yeah. that very fascinating as well. Yeah, and, and uh, it would be lovely to see a, a bit more uh, convergence, although I'm not quite sure the convergence of showing a, a boxing match on Tidal is kind of the convergence that I'm looking for. Uh, I was so confused when I got that email. I'm not sure I already mentioned it on the show, but uh, when I said well, that, it's not, it's same, same here, but some people are. You know, that was a really popular thing, and if you can stream it, cool. I mean, I haven't had a television since uh, 2001 or something, so. Right, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> I mean, I have a TV, but I, I only watch on demand, on demand services, so yeah. uh, that's sort of uh, what everybody's doing right now and uh, and yeah so we'll see what happens you know I, I'm kind of thinking you know if, if somebody like Zane Lowe could make an awesome show for mm -hmm. Apple radio and then sort of draw people in and then say oh you can listen to the songs on demand on the paid subscription service and there could be some traction there to uh, to get a few few things moving but uh, the other thing is that we don't know if the Apple service is gonna be internationally uh, have, have any international coverage at all uh, that's sort of something that people haven't really poked around uh, on in terms of uh, uh, rumors because we don't know uh, a beat never launched outside of the US and so uh, Apple has to negotiate those deals from scratch uh, with any territory where we might want to go outside of the US and, and if the launch is only US that would be massively disappointing I think for a lot of people in Europe mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. I mean they're a worldwide company they're big enough that I'm sure they'll figure it out um, Glenn probably knows more about the rumors than I do but um, <laughs> I would be surprised if it was US only it's such a global company yeah yeah I wouldn't be surprised if it, it launches first in the US only and quickly in many other territories I mean the, the iTunes music store is available and hundred something I don't know the number exactly I want to say about 180 countries although that's nearly every country uh, on the planet it seems so um, the, the point being that um, Apple has a huge footprint to work with and um, and I think they'll launch in markets where it makes sense and some markets aren't going to be ready for it um, some markets are you know are barely ready for downloads and the download is, is a very new um, format. So um, the US and uh, a lot of uh, Europe seems to make sense. And um, you know, maybe Brazil because there are some competitors in Brazil. Yeah. Uh, but um, US, US at first makes sense. It, it's Apple's home turf. And I think it's where they need to, uh, to, to make some inroads first. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, one of the, going from a, a very, very old uh, uh, service to a, a relatively new service, at least in the way it's been used, uh, uh, I've been, I've always been pretty bad at Instagram. I mean, I like the idea, I just never quite got around to remembering going to check my Instagram feed. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know why. I was going to ask if I can Instagram this, so I'm totally of the course, opposite. Of course, yeah. You can absolutely but that's do interesting. You can absolutely do. It's just it just feels like an extra thing that I had to check, and so I kind of never ended up going into the habit of actually doing it. Uh, although every time I go, I kind of think, "Oh my God, there's so many so many cool things that should be on here," but then I kind of forget again. So it kind of that, that's how it works. Uh, but Instagram announced the uh, announced the launch of a new official community, uh, the first one, the first the first official community on the service, as far as uh, I understand, uh, which will, will be uh, living under the handle of at music, which is kind of a Twitter like in, in, in the way that it's been set up, which is weird. But uh, yeah, it's essentially actually going to be a, 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 a way to bring together the, the 300 plus million users that are interested in music uh, uh, and uh, sort of of course uh, highlight some of the posts that are being made by some of the world's biggest uh, sort of uh, music stars uh, 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 all over, you know, I guess, you know, I was looking at the Taylor Swift numbers and they were absolutely insane. Uh, she posted a photo and literally within 24 hours it had like 1.2 million likes. It was just like absolutely crazy numbers. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, this is kind of interesting because Twitter has tried to do a music community and it didn't quite work. Uh, Instagram is just keeping it simple. It's just keeping it to the actual post. It's not doing anything fancy. It's not actually putting music in, in, in it. There's no licensing issues there. So, uh, I don't know, Emily, do you think that this, uh, uh, as somebody that also works a, a lot in, in trying to market artists too, mm -hmm. uh, do you think this is, is a cool new feature and, and can Instagram sort of galvanize its, its, its base uh, around music in this way? Yeah, I think it's 
awesome anytime a major social media company focuses on music. You know, that's yeah. not something I take lightly. Um, it's interesting to see where Facebook and Instagram want to take music. Um, but I have to say for a lot of my kind of indie artists, um, they like Instagram because they have that creative eye. So whereas they might be a little intimidated by Twitter, like, oh, what do I post? I don't want to post what I'm eating for breakfast, whatever. It's like they get Instagram, even if it's just like, oh, wow, that's a beautiful scene I can take, you know, outside of the bus or whatever that we're passing. So um, I think Instagram and music is a pretty natural fit. Uh, we also also because you can do video on it, you know, right. like we have a young EDM artist named Fox Stevenson and he'll just like, you know, video a snippet of his new song uh, while videoing like a stuffed cat or something. And his fans go nuts for it. You know, like we didn't tell him to do that. Um, but I think Instagram tends to make sense to artists a little bit more than um, Twitter or even Facebook, where you're just kind of like bearing yourself, right. you know, like. Instagram's visual, um, I think it fits really well with music, and uh, I, I think it's great that they're reaching out to our community. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Glenn, do you agree that this is going to be uh, p potentially more successful than, than Twitter's uh, original initiative? Well, that's a pretty low bar to clear. <laughs> the thing about social media and music is uh, nothing works from the top down very well. And, and social media and music uh, is all about bottom-up uh, momentum and letting the fans choose what they like and what they want to pass along. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think much of this. I think this is really much to do about nothing. Um, and and again, it really comes from top-down not working so well in social media. Uh, uh, Tumblr started some kind of music editorial uh, music section a while ago. I don't think that really. Uh, did a whole lot. Twitter has not had much success with uh, any top-down editorial or top-down services. Um, Facebook, Facebook seems to, you know, gotten out of the music game. They don't pay as, as much attention to it uh, as they used to back when they were best friends with Spotify. Yeah. And um, and other than just having label relations people and artist relations people, I don't know what else Facebook needs to do. So Facebook needs to um, make a make a platform that artists want to use and that their fans want to use, and and that's really I think the extent of their involvement in music. Um, so I think the same with Instagram. I I, I think it might be a nice little um, a nice little section to go visit. Uh, they're not gonna I mean they're gonna have what a couple three four posts a week in music. So yeah. over, across a year, that's not gonna be. Uh, that's not going to be a ton of exposure for any one artist. Um, and I, again, again I, I think the fans decide what's good on social media. Yeah. And I don't think it works well the other way around. Yeah. And, you know, we're saying also Twitter, uh, obviously we mentioned it for this slightly doomed uh, uh, m music idea, but Twitter still has a very uh, vibrant music community and uh, they've actually uh, appointed a new head of music uh, and uh, he's, uh, he's called uh, Sunil Singhvi and he's a uh, London-based, actually an employee, uh, London-based, and he will move to the US in September to take on this new role. Uh, in the meantime, it's sort of like a bit of a question mark around Twitter in general, just because the earnings calls uh, keep disappointing investors. Uh, Stock, the stock took a hit uh, this week, a pretty bad hit. Uh, and uh, even people like, you know, Joss Whedon, we saw like a, saying that he was leaving Twitter because uh, there was not enough engagement and, and too much trolling, essentially. And so the, the, it, there seem to be a few question marks forming now around the future of Twitter as well as a platform. Uh, and I'm, I honestly don't know, as, as this is sort of a, a last rap show, I, I'm not sure what to say around that. I still love it. I understand what the issues are uh, for those people. I don't know if this is going to translate into a mass movement or if it's just a few disgruntled people that are leaving. Uh, I really don't know. I, Emily, do you think that, that this is a trend? Uh, is Twitter in danger in the long term? Uh, well, I think everything's in danger in the long term. You of know, course, what yeah. if we built our platforms on Friendster or MySpace or things like that? Um, that said, I think it's a pretty simple and straightforward uh, platform. And if you actually look at the earnings, I think they just missed what they projected. So it's not like it was a huge disaster by any means. Um, it's a straightforward platform. It's a huge platform. It's wildly popular. Um, I definitely agree here that um, even though they have music, you know, and music people, um, it is very top down and it is very cluttered. Um, so that can be difficult to break through the noise. But um, I think Twitter 
we're doing fine for now. Yeah, I hope so because I, I love it. Yeah. So I, I hope I can continue using <laughs> well, it. Well, that's the, way. the point. That's why it's not going anywhere in the near future. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Glenn, from from your point of view, do you, do you think that uh, there is something they can do? You know, they, they've tried now to to create this uh, non-logging page for people that are not actually part of Twitter, so that when they land on uh, Twitter.com, they don't see just a login; they see some content on there. Do you think they can move to becoming the go-to place for instant news? I mean, for a lot of people, they already are, but that's for a lot of people that are users. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if they can be the same for people that are not used to going on Twitter and searching for stuff. Well, you know, Twitter is not as popular as as Facebook, or uh, if I'm not mistaken, not as popular as Instagram. Um, and I think, um, well, you, I, I think the word you use that's very instructive here is the word news. Yeah. And it is a place for news. And let's face it, um, most people on the internet would rather look at pictures than read the news. Right. And that will dictate who gets the traffic. Um, so I think as a news platform, Twitter's great. That's how I use it. I think as a communication platform, Twitter's great. And we see this in other countries uh, with, uh, with restrictive governments. And, um, and uh, Egypt, for example, Twitter was very instrumental in yeah. um, gathering people uh, for public protests. I think it's really wonderful for things like that and it helps messages and communication spread very quickly. Um, but, you know, who knows? I mean, who knows? People could, um, people could tire, they could go to Instagram. Uh, Instagram could make a few tweaks and kind of yeah. it's Twitter for a lot of people. Um, or Twitter could make a few tweaks and, and just kind of come out of this really just fine. And, and as far as earnings, um, we, I, I tend to think that they'll, they'll figure things like that out over time. Yeah. Now, in the long run, like Emily said, I mean, in the long run, everything is in jeopardy. And in, as the famous saying goes, in the long run, we're all dead. So yeah. <laughs> who knows what will happen in the long run. But um, in, the, in the short term, in the, really, in, we can only talk about three to five years here with any sure. remote um, chance of, of being accurate. Um, I think Twitter will be fine over the next three to five years. And when you have um, when you have a company with that's well capitalized and able to attract top or near top talent, um, I think the product will be able to evolve. Yeah. So it's just one of those. It's it's one of a very few uh, standard social media tools that's out there. Um, and you know they have a lot of room to grow. That's a good thing. They do have a lot of room to grow. Yeah. And if they can if they can figure out better ways to use audio and video and, and pictures. I think that'll help a lot. Yeah, and it feels like uh, for me, Twitter is more reliable just because on Facebook, I have seen a bunch of news over the last uh, few months that have turned out to be bogus. And the only reason mm -hmm. why they appeared and they continue to appear in everybody's feeds was because people were <coughs> clicking on them. And mm -hmm. it didn't seem like the algorithm was being able to distinguish between something that was real and something that wasn't real. Yeah. And just because it's all based on, I mean, a, a silly example, but like uh, I had a post that came up a couple, last month that said, oh, Angela Lans Lansbury's died. Uh, and I was like, oh, no, that's, that's a shame. And, uh, and then my girlfriend was like, oh, that's weird because I, th I thought she was in a play in London. And I was like, okay, I'll check. And then she hadn't died. And then my parents come from Italy and my mom almost never uses Facebook. But uh, one thing that she told me, because she knew that I, when I was little, I liked murder, she wrote. <laughs> she was like, oh, have you seen that Angela Lansbury died? And I was like, I didn't think she had. And then I was oh like, where did, where did you see it? And she was like, yeah. oh, I saw it on Facebook. And again, it was like not true, but you know, because you don't see who posted the news, you just see that the, the piece right. uh, coming up. Whilst on Twitter, there is accountability because essentially it's either a retweet or it's uh, you, you search and you find the most retweeted tweet about that story and you sort of work out what the actual uh, news is. So yeah, that's kind of an, an interesting point that I just wanted to bring up in terms of reliability of the two platforms. Uh, uh, perhaps there is something that Facebook can do to improve on that. Um, and I think Twitter could also do better in developing countries, just like Facebook is really yeah. targeted developing countries. And, and if I'm not mistaken, they've done deals with mobile carriers to, to let people uh, browse Facebook for free because, um, because people in, in a lot of other countries don't have unlimited data. Um, they, have to be, they have to be a little more choosy with uh, their data packages and how much they use and if they get free Facebook. They'll use it. Um, Twitter could also do things like that. There's a lot of growth out there. So yeah, yeah. I hope so. 
I, I think it's a great platform. Yeah, exactly. Me too. And uh, uh, that's. F- uh, I guess we can cl- close up by talking about live uh, for a few minutes because uh, that's an area that DMT hasn't really covered that much over the last few years. Uh, uh, and one of the things that came up this week was the fact that Live Nation, and it's, it's close to you, Glenn, I guess, uh, Live Nation has uh, uh, taken a majority stake in, in a Bonnaroo uh, Music and Arts Festival. Um, it's Bonnaroo, right? I'm pronouncing yeah, it Yeah, right. I, th- I think I've been to about 10 of them, including the first one. I mean, Glenn's probably been to a bunch living there. But um, right. sorry, sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean no, to No, no, I, I just I, I essentially you know that the story is that this has happened. Uh, the founders are saying that this it will not impact the spirit of, of the festival and actually will enable them to provide more services to uh, uh, the attendees. Obviously, my, you know, one of my observations was that, uh, as usual, these things go well as partnerships and, uh, up and, until the festival continues to make money and be profitable. Uh, as soon as something happens, uh, obviously, a company like Live Nation could... Uh, uh, dramatically alter the way that the festival uh, works or is run uh, so it's always a bit of a question mark there but uh, you know Emily so as somebody has been do you think that this is a, at all a concern or uh, it was just business as usual for you well I think the press release in these kind of mergers and buyouts is always that there's going to be more services and better so that was that almost seemed like boilerplate to me yeah. um, people are really outraged and upset about this or a lot you know I kind of came up business wise in the jam community so I think a lot of people are surprised by that I'm not totally offended um, or things like that. You know, knowing the people that founded this festival and the fact that they sold all the tickets online by themselves and sold out in 2001 or whatever that was, um, that's amazing. And what they've done to grow the festival over the past uh, 10, 15 years is is incredible. It's also a ton of work, you know, and as people get older, um, you do want partners. Some people want more money, you know. I think it's honestly um, people growing up. Yeah. Uh, but it is very shocking to people because Bonnaroo has done such a great job um, of integrating sponsors and partners that really make sense for the fans and the community. So I think that's why it's a little shocking and scary to people that that would go away. Yeah. Um, um, I think even the best corporate. You know, the best corporate people with the best hearts and best intentions um, still don't always totally get it. I don't know if they were there in 2001 or whatever. So we'll see what happens. But um, I don't I don't blame Superfly and AC and things like that. I, I, I get why those guys did it. Um, I just hope everybody stays true to what it is because it is a really special thing. I mean, you need to remember, like, when I was a kid in the 90s, I dreamed of Glastonbury and Reading and Leeds. We didn't have U.S. Yeah. festivals. Um, so that was one of the first, and it was really special and cool. And now it's it's a bit oversaturated, but um, yeah, I, I hope Bonnaroo doesn't lose that heart and spirit because it is a really special festival. Yeah, yeah, uh, Glenn, in, in, in sort of uh, in your area, what was the reaction? Given that it's only a few few miles down the road, you know, I can only speak to my opinion here, uh, which is is kind of like Emily's. It's not a big surprise. Um, this is the world we live in where uh, more entrepreneurs start a festival, build the festival, and sell the festival. And uh, this is what Live Nation um, CEO Michael Orfino said in the earnings call. Live Nation does not tend to want to take that risk of trying to to create a festival and and take that financial risk and build it over many years. They come in once the brand uh, has been established and and once the the festival is is, uh, secure. And I think that Live Nation is smart enough to know what the, the Bonnaroo brand is. Yeah. Uh, even though I think that has changed quite a bit since the first Bonnaroo, it's a different type of festival that attracts yeah. different types of, of music fans. Um, but really, the, there are a lot of charms in Bonnaroo, uh, and that, that I think is a lot of the value, just the, the, the atmosphere there, uh, the location. Uh, you know, it's kind of in a part of the country where that doesn't have a lot of other festivals like that. Um, the the involvement of the local community in Bonnaroo yeah. is very special to it as well. So all these are, I think, assets to Bonnaroo that um, Live Nation will will continue to to keep going. It's just part of the the conference at this point. Yeah. Or kind of part of the festival. Now, it might change over time, and it might change. You know, the the lineup or some parts of Bonnaroo might change just because it needs to change, not because Live Nation uh, is being run by a bunch of bean counters. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, and uh, you know, it feels like uh, this is the 
the way that things go as you said you know like a, a, a small label can get bought up by a major and, and you know a, sm a small startup can be bought, get bought up by a bigger company that's just how, how things uh, work uh, there were some question marks yesterday around how many l l companies like and management companies and all sorts of different things uh, uh, Live Nations owns uh, I, I think people were sort of uh, <laughs> made a list that was it wasn't entirely accurate but uh, but it was pretty good uh, and it was impressive to see how many uh, how, how many ha tentacles Live Nation has at, the, at this stage but uh, uh, that's sort of the way it works with these uh, huge uh, conglomerates. And uh, finally, on the on the live side, I actually wanted to also uh, uh, congratulate Bandpage on launching a new partnership with uh, StubHub uh, 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 to offer uh, their merchandise uh, sort of engine uh, uh, within the ticket purchase uh, uh, experience, which could be quite interesting. Obviously, StubHub is not uh, much loved here in the UK. There's been a lot of calls to uh, regulate the secondary ticket market in a, in a stronger way because a lot of people buy tickets and then sell them on uh, but it's great to see uh, Bandpage continue to expand their, their sort of uh, integration and hopefully offer f musicians a better way to uh, sell their uh, their uh, stuff uh, I don't know I mean, if any of your artists have used those tools to put merch on, on Spotify and those, and those places and if, if it's been working yeah, we're very pro Bandpage. Um, we're not using the StubHub integration yet, um, but any partnerships they can bring in. I mean, I love Jay. Uh, he definitely does it for the right reasons. So I, I, I think that's a very smart partnership, and I'm excited to see Bandpage continue to grow. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and Glenn, on the live side, do you think that this kind of stuff is where the next evolution is? Uh, clearly, we haven't seen a huge amount of evolution on, on live on other fronts. You know, ticketing is still a bit of a, a pain, uh, but that doesn't seem to be a conundrum that can be solved just because it's in the hands of huge conglomerates that probably don't want to change. Uh, do you think that this kind of integration is sort of the, the only frontier to evolve this, this space? No, I, you know, I think something like this will probably get on the margins. I think that the bigger revolution is going to be um, digital online services, cloud-based services that improve um, the customer experience at live, uh, at live events. Right. And that's a place that just has been ignored until recently. So I think um, allowing customers to order merchandise, order drinks, order food, everything from the mobile phone at a, a live concert. Um, I think that probably will do more for merchandise sales than partnerships with ticketing companies, if I had to guess. That's, that's, that's a very good point. And then we've seen a few startups over the years uh, that are doing this, but uh, uh, only a few festivals are deploying it on a large scale. Obviously, there's still technological issues around uh, Wi-Fi connectivity that are still being worked out at some of the larger events and so uh, no matter how many routers they seem to put in it never seems to be enough uh, so, or how many charging points for mobile phones uh, they're gonna have to have some, yeah, exactly. Always some a problem. yeah they're gonna have to have Apple watch charging stations at uh, Glastonbury <laughs> this year I guess awesome <laughs> love it and well uh, I think that brings us to the end of the show but uh, once again uh, I would like to thank you so much for your time uh, Emily any a new artists or anything that you want to uh, sort of uh, push uh, before before we close? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm really busy uh, setting up uh, a lot of music for Matthew Friedberger of the Fiery Furnaces. And as I mentioned, Fox Stevenson is an EDM artist who's doing really, really well, as is uh, our indie darling Springtime Carnivore. So feel free to check them all out. Awesome. And you also have a new startup. We should mention that as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's called Dream Fuel. I actually founded it with Justin Kalifowitz, the president of nice. uh, Downtown Music Publishing. Although it has nothing to do with music, uh, it is crowdfunding for athletes. So if you check out dreamfuel.me, we're basically taking a lot of these things we do in the music space and applying it to sports. And Justin's great, so I'm sure you'll, you'll make yeah. a fantastic team. And uh, Glenn, on your front, uh, anything uh, exciting coming up? A billboard, I know that you got uh, the awards coming up. Uh, uh, anything else? <laughs> Well, I'll be at Canadian Music Week this weekend and Music right. Biz Festival uh, Conference, not festival, uh, festivals on the brain. Music Biz Conference in Nashville next weekend. Oh, wow. Excellent. Uh, I, I have uh, plans to visit Nashville at some point. Uh, uh, my girlfriend is, wants to do a holiday there sometime next June. I have to plan a lot of things now because with uh, all these studies, it's all very uh, academically <laughs> set up. And I've never thought uh, sort of a year and a half in advance, but that's sort of what you have to do. Uh, but yeah, so hopefully. If this uh, is June, you can come for CMA Music Festival and Bonnaroo. So you can mm -hmm. kill two. 
I know that would be great. Actually, I'm still waiting to hear, to hear the dates for my exams in June 2016. Uh, if it is the week before those things, I will definitely try and make it out, make it out there for uh, sure. one, one of the two. I also love country music, as, as I have already declared on the show previously. Uh, we, <laughs> we ended up in a, a sort of, uh, we did a holiday in Minnesota and the lakes and the Great Lakes last October. And I had country radio on the whole time, and so I got massively addicted to it. <laughs> it's amazing. So, so yeah, so. I, I support Nashville also. You should definitely get there if you can. It's an amazing place. So yeah, I will know all the songs. Uh, anyway, I should probably close. Uh, thanks so much again for your time, uh, both of you, and thanks so much for listening to DMT. Uh, once again, this is the last episode of the regular weekly show. Uh, I will probably record some uh, random shows here and there, especially if big news drops, like uh, you know Apple releasing their service or stuff like that. Uh, hopefully, so the best thing you can do is to sign up to the mailing list on bit.ly slash dmt list to find out um, uh, when the shows are coming out it's not going to be a weekly mailing list so don't worry about it clogging up your inbox it's literally just going to be a way to notify people when uh, if and when shows are out thanks so much for listening have a fantastic week and until next time